Hello, everybody, and welcome. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Stephanie Jordan. I'm the co-founder of Avalen, founder of Drinking Out Loud, and more importantly, I'm your host for today. Um, somewhere in here is, is Tim Erdington Judge, Avalen's other co-founder, and the man behind Healthy Hospo. Now, today you are joining us for our sixth installment of Positively Charged. And this is one that I am really excited for because, my gosh, it has been a year. And finally, tis the season to be jolly. Um, but this season is a very important one and something that we need to keep in our consciousness um, when we head into our Christmas festivities and our friends in the US and Canada having already kicked things off with Thanksgiving. Um, there's a lot of things to consider, especially from an environmental perspective. So this session is named A Waste-Free Festive Season. Ultimately, what we're looking to explore today is how we can keep our joyousness of Christmas um, without necessarily giving the planet a hangover. So in order to kick off this session, I actually just wanted to read a passage from uh, Jen Gale, which I know my friends from My Green Pod have heard of, Sustainably-ish founder. Now, she wrote this the other day on her blog, and allow me to just read this to you. Christmas is coming, and there's no escape. We're on the downhill slope to the biggest consumer festival of the year. And I think it's about time for a sanity check. We all want to create magical memories for our kids and families, but in the process of doing that, we're building an appalling legacy for them. Plastic clogged oceans, overflowing landfill sites, and potentially a climate and landscape that may well be pretty much uninhabitable. Ouch, not quite so joyous. She then uh, goes on to state a series of not so fun festive facts basically revealing how wasteful and damaging our festive consumptions can be. For example, one of those is that in the UK alone, we waste around 250,000 tonnes of food every Christmas. She explains that that's about the weight of the Empire State Building, or, for the animal lovers, 100,000 elephants. It's a heck of a lot, really. I, I understand the elephants better than the Empire State Building. Um, the point being, ultimately, is that, you know, we're going to have one heck of an impact on the planet over the next couple of days. And here at Avalens HQ, we truly believe that some small changes uh, collectively executed will allow for a more positive planet. And that is something that we're looking to explore today. There is good news in all of this, especially when it comes to food. I think all of us here could agree that there's definitely a growing awareness about the ecological impact of the food that we eat. However, the question we are asking ourselves is, but what about the tipple that we drink? So uh, Tim has recently actually teamed up with a Dutch-based company called EcoChain, which is an environmental intelligent platform and also alongside an alternative uh, media hub called Positive News. And together, they've been exploring how we can sip sustainably this Christmas. Um, and as they like to say, without giving the planet a hangover. And to be honest, getting to grips with the real ecological impact of booze is really, really sobering stuff. And actually one that we might hold off talking to you about until next year. Because for now, we do want to focus at the task at hand, which is bringing a little bit of festive joy, uh, whether it's looking at eco-conscious gifting through to cozy cocktails via brewing delicious wasted Christmas trees into beer from actually not having a Christmas tree, Christmas tree at all and believing that a tree is for life. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the number one worker bee. He's going to introduce our amazing panellists of today. Thanks, Steph. Um, hello, everyone, from my alternative home, aka the shed at the bottom of the garden. I'm really excited for our final Positively Charged uh, of the year. And we've got some amazing speakers for this one. So keep things short. I'm going to introduce our amazing speakers. Um, first up, we have the wonderful Katie Hill, who is co-founder 
of my green pod uh, and also owner of one of the most fantastic chairs I've ever seen. Uh, my green pod is an ethical lifestyle media company uh, online shopping platform that is aiming to be the sustainable alternative uh, to Amazon. And they embed restoration into every single transaction and every transaction on my green pod, uh, they will plant a tree. So we really can save the world through some better consumption habits. Um, next up, we have Alan McDonnell, who is the conservation manager for Trees for Life is an amazing charity based up in Scotland that is doing the work of rewilding uh, one of the most beautiful parts of the world up near Loch Ness. Uh, they include all aspects of habitat and species recovery plus other environmental initiatives uh, from concept to scoping, feasibility, delivery and review as they try and restore the, the native Caledonian forest uh, to Scotland. Little fun fact, in 2015, I cycled from London up to, to Dundragon, um, their estate, to raise money for, for Trees for Life charity. And if you ever have the opportunity to go, um, it is one of the most beautiful forests I've ever been to in my life. Kind of like a Disney forest from, the, from the Snow White. Um, third, we have one of Amsterdam's best bartenders, Tim Lefebvre. Uh, Founder of the Highball Project, sustainability geek, um, born in Belgium, but now raised, based in Amsterdam, spends most of his days trying to find creative rabbit holes, um, pushing the sustainability of drinks, really challenging uh, the impact of, of the drinks that go across cocktail bars. And he is determined to help the world drink, uh, the help better the world one drink at a time. Um, and then Finally, we have the amazing, and just on time, he turned up one minute before we went live, uh, Freddie Kampman. We've tried to have Freddie on before, but last time um, he had a great excuse that his wife was being rushed to hospital to give birth. Um, so this is our second time, and we're really, really happy to have Freddie on with us today. Freddie is the Chief Botanical Officer um, at Lowlander Beer, which is a, a beer company based in the Netherlands that is really, really challenging uh, what we know beer to be. Freddie believes that every beer is an opportunity to tell a story about the wonder of botanicals, and we hope to connect people with the natural world that creates more diverse beers of both flavour and character. So it's not just about making a lager, making an IPA, making a stout, it's bringing in the world of botanicals into the amazing, uh, amazing production of their beers. And he'll tell you more about that a bit later on. So that is our amazing panel of speakers. Yeah. All right. So from a housekeeping perspective, guys, our speakers are going to talk in a round table. They have 10, 15 minutes each. You're welcome to ask them questions live with the chat function and the Q&A, and they can answer you directly. We will also then open up um, the session for a Q&A with everyone at the end of everyone's talk. Um, Anything else to say? I suppose no. We hope that you really enjoy this holiday edition of Positively Charged and that you uh, go away feeling inspired. Whether you're watching this live or in a recording, uh, Positively Charged exists to ignite the conversation around sustainability and um, basically drive these kind of positive conversations. So we hope that you take away at least one action that you can do um, to have a positive impact on the planet. So without further ado, we are going to start with Lady Katie Hill. Uh, Katie, will you be sharing your screen or will you be speaking live? I won't, I'll speak live if that's all right. Fantastic. Over to you. So thank you for having me. This is a, this is a, a, a treat for me because I love Christmas. I love everything about Christmas. Um, I love the possibility that it might snow. I love the candles. I love the hanging out with family. I love just all of it. But as you've already touched on, Steph, there's the kind of dark side that there's the dark side of Christmas that we all know about and that nobody likes and that we all end up feeling a little bit guilty about. And there are just so many traditions that we do without ever sort of thinking about them. We inherit them and we're born into them and we just kind of, we, we continue and then we're complicit in them. So we buy things that we wouldn't normally buy. Um, we go to shops that we'd never normally shop at and that we tell everybody now, there's no chance I'd ever go into that shop. And yet we do do it at Christmas. We give our family food that we would never 
dream of putting it in front of them any other day of the year. Um, and then obviously the potential for waste is just, it's just huge and it's scaled up by big business and all this kind of emotional advertising. So we actually um, just popped a question up in front of you. Yeah. Um, so the question is, how much wrapping paper is used in the UK every year? Just for context, we're using the UK because it feels like a size that we can just about fathom. If we were using global stats, our minds would explode. Um, so you've got a couple of seconds to answer this and then we'll publish the results as Katie keeps talking. Okay, so yeah, just have a look at that because this is exactly what, this is the kind of thing that we're talking about with all this waste. Um, but I don't want to, I really don't want to dwell on that. I want to talk about all the amazing stuff that's happening because every year it's getting easier and easier to keep all of that Christmas magic alive without that big side dish of guilt that we get. Um, so high street names now, huge high street names are all kind of listening to what shoppers want. Um, Morrison's has said that it's going to remove glitter from all of its Christmas range this year. It said that the toys and its crackers are going to be plastic free, so they'll be made with wood. There you go, there's the, oh, is that the, is that the voting? Yeah. What's the actual, what's the answer? So it's split, isn't it? 50-50, wowee. So it's 227,000 miles. Um, it's just mind boggling. I mean, even as you say, for the UK, it's mind boggling, never mind trying to think of a global statistic. But that's, uh, yeah, Mo moving on to the positive. <laughs> Let's move on to less guilt and waste and talk about all these amazing things that are happening because there are lots. Um, I think Waitrose and John Lewis has said that it's going to take glitter from its single use Christmas products like um, crackers and wrapping paper and bags and things like that. Asda's getting in on it. It's got its first sustainable Christmas range this year. Tesco only uses edible glitter. Um, there's just so much happening and it's all because people are the saying they don't want this anymore. Um, they're not happy with the amount of waste. They're not happy with the amount of single use plastic. They're not happy with a lot of these traditions that we're inheriting. They want them to change. And the amazing news is that big business is helping to facilitate it. Um, and there are also just so many more ethical gifts available every year. So I think my favourite ones, you can you can buy an acre with the World Land Trust and it's um, it just protects that land because you're you're conserving it for the people that rely on it and all the wildlife inside it. Um, and there are there are lots. I mean, there are lots and lots of ethical gifts. You just need to do a, a quick Google search and you'll find all the different charities that you can support. And I think people are getting a lot more okay about that idea. I'm not sure. I think a few years ago, it was one of those things where you might have had to have a conversation with the person first because you kind of you kind of need to know your audience. A child probably is not going to be that excited about having a cow given to them for Christmas um, or a goat gifted to them. Um, so I think it is important to know, maybe just have that conversation and say, look, we're looking to do this this year. Um, I hope that's all right with you. But I think this year it does seem like it's a lot more acceptable and people are a lot more willing to have um, charity gifts given to them. Um, the gift of time, you know, that's a really important thing as well. That's something that you can give that's just, that's just there, it's yours. You can give kids a skill. Um, you can teach them to ride a bike, give them an hour of your time every week, teach them to roller skate, teach them to go swimming. Um, and homemade gifts as well. That's a really nice thing to do. Don't ever underestimate the power of a homemade gift. You could get a lovely bottle of Avalon, um, get some, make some beautiful, just, just, I don't know, some nuts or something or roast some nuts and put them in a nice jar and tie some ribbon around the jar. And then you, there you go. It's a beautiful handmade, thoughtful Christmas present. And people love a handmade gift. Um, you've got eBay as well. I think this year has been a bit strange, hasn't it? Because I would normally, do a big um do sort of charity shop um shopping throughout the year and just pick up little bits because I'm a big fan of pre-loved things and and reused things but because of lockdown obviously there's been no you can't really you can't really get to the shops but e there's eBay that's um fantastic for pre-loved things um and there's yeah I would I think there is also a kind of a range of stuff that you can't get secondhand so beauty products if you're um it's just nice to make people feel special isn't it at christmas people like to have a kind of they like to feel indulged um i think if if you know about clean beauty already 
and you know what to look out for in the ingredients, fantastic. Don't compromise your own ethics when you're buying for the people. Stick to those ethics. Um, <clears throat> if you don't know, don't try and learn. Don't try and learn now because it's an absolute minefield. So just, I would say, look for logos like the Nitru logo, um, Soil Association, Cosmos, Natural or Organic. Um, companies like will lead all of their products are natural. That's a great place to start. But just yeah, maybe don't don't try and learn it all really quickly now before Christmas. Just go for those companies and look for those logos that you know are trusted and that, you know, those companies look at the whole supply chain as well. So um, they're kind of doing all that hard work for you. Um, and wrapping, the wrapping situation, I mean, obviously that's a whole lot of wrapping paper that we get through every year, but there, there are so many other alternatives you can use newspapers, magazines, fabric, like make them make, you can make your, um, you can actually make it quite funny. If you look for articles, try and match articles to the, to the recipient of the gift and you can make it quite funny and quite tongue in cheek and make sure that there's an article or a headline that you think might resonate with that person. Um, and then tie, you know, use, use um, ribbon and fabric and things instead of tape. And then we're kind of, you're already starting to cut down on a lot of that waste that people don't really feel happy about and that people don't want to do. Um, there's a company called Rewrap that makes really beautiful wrapping paper as well. That's it's all 100% recycled, 100% recyclable, um, and it's printed using vegetable-based inks. So if you need to buy if you need to buy wrapping paper, just look for a company that's making paper that can be recycled and that won't end up in landfill because the count the council can't handle it um, on Boxing Day. Uh, Loop Loops great for Christmas cards. That's a really lovely company that they what they do is they the cards all recycled, and then there are wildflower seeds um, sewn into the sewn into the card. So instead of throwing the card away, you would you just plant it in the ground, and then you get wildflowers growing out of it. I mean, it's a beautiful thing for kids and for adults. It's just a really nice alternative because you just think those cards are up for like a couple of weeks, and then they just all end up in the bin, and it's just it's horrific. So anything positive that you can um, that you can get out of something that could have been waste is just is, is brilliant and there are so many companies now popping up to solve some of the problems um that we've kind of got ourselves stuck into and i think for me the bottom line is just to um to think about what you're buying and how it makes you feel and not get up in like get swept up in this buying frenzy that makes you feel really guilty because that's not what Christmas should be about it should be fun and it should be all about the magic and the the joy of it all and the the giving presents that make you feel good not just oh my god I've got to get this present for somebody I don't know what to buy for them and you end up buying anything just to kind of have something on the day um try to just support companies that have got ethics that are like your own ethics um that are doing great things that are supporting bees that are supporting trees that are supporting the environment um we're doing something that's, we're planting a tree um, in the tropics with every transaction on our marketplace now, on the My Green Pop marketplace. So you can find ethical products and any transaction, whether it's like a very, very small one or a, a big one, um, will pay for a, a tree to be planted through our charity partner, Tree Sisters. And I think quite a few companies are doing this now and it's really, it's so lovely to see. Um, and it just means that, yes, there are times that you're not gonna use pre-used or pre-loved things and you do need to buy something but just just trying to get into that mindset of when you take something make sure that you're also giving back at the same time um and then all of this kind of this guilt that's surrounded around Christmas and this waste will hopefully be able to make a thing of the past and you'll be able to keep all of that magic of Christmas alive without being sucked over onto the dark side of it awesome Thank you so much. I think you're so right in, in the guilt part. And it's funny because I personally feel that it pushes me to just check out. Like, right, what's the point? I'm just going to do nothing. And then it's a bit bar humbuggy. <laughs> so there's a middle ground. And I think the other thing you're saying is time and taking the time to create these personalized gifts. And actually, it's already the 8th of December. And it's like, oh, I should have baked 100,000 cookies by now. Um, but yeah, any, any last words that you'd like to leave our audience with? No, I just, that's it really. The most important thing, I think when it's in terms of ethical gifts and ethical buying, just, just don't, don't, like let's, this, this year has been rubbish for so many people. It's been horrible. People have been stuck in the house. You might not be able to get to see your family. The last thing people want right now is to feel guilty about having a nice time at Christmas. So 
don't just make sure that you're doing everything that feels right to you and that you're buying from companies that you as you were saying before Steph you know that kind of people that are looking after the planet for future generations and that when you give a gift to a child there's not this kind of this this shadow over it that's you know what's the future going to look like for this child because I've bought this plastic gift from from and the air miles associated with it are just awful just try and make everything as honest as it can be in your own heart and with your own ethics and your own consciousness and then you know there's we'll quickly get rid of all of this guilt and all of this darkness around what should be the most amazing fun beautiful time of the year when you actually get to switch your phone off switch your computer off sit with your family and just have a lovely time so let's just keep it keep it exactly as it should be oh very well said thank you so much katie thank you lovely all right well audience if you do have any questions for katie if you'd like to know any of the companies that she referenced please just write to her in the chat if not head over to mygreenpod.co.uk um i don't think they're shipping you're not shipping outside of the uk currently are you katie no no but um it is a hugely inspirational platform they've done all the hard work for us they're a truly trusted source um and if you know you've not got the time to, to put in the legwork to find out what is the most sustainable gift for your child this year trust me katie has um so go check it out and uh, and get inspired awesome okay so next up we are going to be talking with alan i believe and alan is going to tell us why a tree is for life and not just for christmas um hi alan welcome hi steph how are you doing um just gonna answer i'm just gonna answer this polling question yes so we launched a question which actually you you told me about just a few days ago and i was gobsmacked <laughs> um so for our audience the question is how old do we estimate the oldest tree in the UK to be? So how old do we think the oldest tree in the UK is? And Alan, I will let you answer that question in due course. Um, so over to you. Okay, thanks, Steph. Um, and hi, everybody. I'm just going to, I'm going to show a few slides. And uh, so this one. So I want to talk today about uh, life in the sense of nature. And nature life and the work that Trees for Life does to uh, to bring nature back to the Scottish Highlands. And we do it through trees. So our trees start here. This is, um, we own uh, an area of land in the Highlands called Dundregan, uh, which is where Tim cycled to all the way from London five years ago, amazingly. Um, and uh, we were very grateful for the money he raised for us. But this is where we grow native trees from seed, collected from seed around the highlands themselves. And we've got um, a bunch of really specialist horticulturalists who work in these in these special trees. And, and that's really, that's the start of our journey, our rewilding journey, as, as we call it, to, uh, to bring nature and allow nature to work uh, across the highlands under its own processes, find its own way. So um, I should just say this is uh, probably the fastest I've ever given this presentation. So it's going to be a, it's going to be a fast forward, sort of a tribute to um, the Reduced Shakespeare Company, um, although I don't aspire to their uh, lofty standards. But uh, cracking on from that from that tree nursery, um, we most of our trees are then planted out in the highlands in suitable sites, almost always by volunteers. Uh, trees for Life was born with volunteers, and it basically began with a bunch of really dedicated people going out into the highlands and uh, looking to restore the Caledonian forest just by planting trees. And uh, that's that's still the core of what we do. And our groups come together, and they have uh, they just have a really open time with each other. They spend a week at a time working and planting trees and uh, just reflecting on uh, on their contribution to nature as yes, they're doing it and, and to rewilding. So the tree's planted and um, what you see is above the ground and uh, that's bringing that forest back. But actually one of the most important parts happens below the ground. Now this is this is a microscope slide, but it's showing, uh, this is a, a microscope shot of a tree root and the white stuff on it, that kind of powdery stuff is a fungus. And that fungus uh, or mycorrhiza is absolutely crucial to, uh, Steph's nodding there, she'll know all about apple tree fungi, I'm sure. I read all, I was the New York uh, Times at podcast about the importance of the fungi this weekend. It's fascinating. It is an amazing, amazing story. So it's basically a symbiosis between the, the fungi 
and, and the tree and the, the, those fungi will uh, they'll go and bring nutrients they'll search for nutrients tiny filaments go throughout the soil and they bring phosphorus and nitrogen and carbon into the tree uh, and then the tree in return is photosynthesizing uh, through its leaves and turning sunlight into energy sugars basically that, that the fungi rely on so without those two together right this in what we used to call the invisible underground stuff um, the trees don't happen uh, and when we do get that to happen, this is Trees for Life's second ever planting site. So this site was planted uh, just over 30 years ago. And you can see there the pines is in Glen Affric. And uh, what you can see here is that this is a, this is a planted forest, but looks uh, very much like a natural forest. And you can see the bigger trees there are ones that we've planted. And you see lots of little baby trees. And that's the real key. If we get those mycorrhizae going and the conditions are right and our planting's been good, we start a kind of a regeneration process and that, that slide there is probably one of our best examples of uh, initiating rewilding again. And what I want to talk about is some of the wildlife that then has followed uh, these, these trees back into the landscape. So one of the first things we found uh, at Glen Africa and at that site is uh, that the mobile things come first. So uh, the wee Tweety Fly things come in. This is Red Pole, uh, which came back into Glen Africa, classic songbird of the Caledonian forest. Crested tit is, is one of the real icons of the forest. Uh, loves pine wood, uh, loves pine forest. Probably maybe a wee bit early to see that in Glen Africa and some of the places we've planted, but a bit further east where there's older forest uh, and dead wood that uh, they can search about in. Yeah, we get cresties. And black grouse were one of the first species back. Black grouse have gone through really steep declines right across the UK. Uh, and so it's fantastic to see how they responded to uh, to our, our planting and, and the and the regeneration of those trees, the forest coming in. So this is still quite a rare bird, um, a really charismatic species. Uh, it's got its own story, which uh, I haven't got time to get into now, but uh, these are two males basically lecking or kind of competing for female attention. All the, all the girly black grouse will be around the edge of the edge of this black grouse lek, just looking to see which one they, they, they like the look of most. And uh, the male that has the best dance uh, basically gets uh, gets the most reward. So I'll, leave it, I'll leave it at that. Uh, and at the same time, I was talking about the underground fungi, but uh, also as as far as come back, we get overground fungi. So this is wood ear growing on uh, on bark and on on dead wood. That's key to recycling. So as we, as a forest comes back recycling the nutrients that those uh, that the trees are bringing down from the sunlight and the fungi are pulling in from the soil they need to keep recycling and as that recycles the soil enriches and becomes more capable so we've got a natural system just starting to turn over here and develop over time so as uh, as wood decays we've also got uh, there's a, there's a timberman beetle um, insects following as well. They're mobile and they're also helping to decompose timber and leaf matter and again contribute to this, this kind of cycling. And as soil conditions improve or, or we get soils coming in then we get you know, some of our classic forest species. So everybody loves the bluebell flushes that we get in, in May. Or uh, sorry this slide's so fuzzy but this is twin flower and this is one of the most beautiful and one of the rarest uh, woodland floor species of the Caledonian forest. Uh, so uh, this kind of classic uh, uh, bipetlar formation of a, of a twin flower that grows across. In some parts of southwest Norway where uh, the forest is really healthy this stuff just carpets the whole forest floor. It's amazing when, when we went there um, about the time Tim was cycling up from London to Dundragon we were walking around Norwegian forest and we couldn't we couldn't bring ourselves to walk on it but then in the end we just had to because there was nowhere else to go. So it, it speaks to what's possible in these in these natural systems if um, if they're able to to work to their own principles. Get the flowers in then you get the pollinators coming in the, so the, the flowers there there's pollen sources available those flowers and the trees as well produce fruits so you that starts to again starts to expand the the insect fauna beyond just um, beyond just the decomposing uh, species that are working off, off deadwood. So we get uh, this white-tailed bumblebee, we get hoverflies, butterflies, a range of, a range of species that are, uh, that are living again in symbiosis with, uh, with the flora in the forest. And of course, this is a super close-up that actually makes, I'm not sure if everybody, if everybody's been to Scotland, you'll have, you'll have met this guy. This is the Highland Midge. Uh, so, okay, so in um, in reality, that that insect is about four millimeters long, 
Um, tiny little black things that get everywhere. Black fly, they're known as, yeah, in Europe. So they will drive you demented with uh, their biting, uh, really itchy, and they come in clouds of millions and millions at a few. And in the wrong place at the wrong time, with no wind, you will know all about it. And uh, I'm sure many of us have experienced that displeasure. But they're a key part of, again, of forest systems. But because there's millions and billions of them, they are a key food source for, uh, for lots of different bigger insects and they're kind of the bottom of the food pyramid and that they're essential to, to a whole range of life. So these, these are a key component of, of our ecology. Uh, so after the flying things that come in, then we have the wee, the wee jumpy runny things and the red squirrel is, uh, is again another kind of uh, flagship species of the Caledonian forest. They love the pine woods, uh, especially where there's a diversity of species like in a natural forest. And they've got a range of different food sources throughout the year. Um, and uh, and they can they can move quite well through forest. There are parts, big parts of Scotland where red squirrels have gone extinct, uh, and we're reintroducing those. We're bringing populations in and uh, letting squirrels go by twenty at a time. Very quickly, they establish new populations. We're we're just absolutely thrilled at, at how well that's working. This is a field vole, and this is a wee bit like the kind of the mammal equivalent of the midge. This is the bottom of the food chain um, for for bigger animals. Uh, where you have enough structure coming into the vegetation and uh, not just in the forest but outside it so that forest is and that all that land is starting to develop you get these wee guys this is a, this is a magnified picture so in fact that field bowl is maybe four inches long five inches long uh, and they, they'll scuttle about uh, and some years they really boom and there's thousands of them in a small area and um, they're charismatic but they also make great uh, prey uh, for predators like this. So where we have that kind of prey coming into the bottom of the food chain is the pine martin coming in and uh, it, will, uh, it will certainly enjoy getting its, getting its teeth into, into some field voles. Um, but also uh, avian predators, this tawny owl, owl. so uh, you know, able to swoop down and, uh, and, uh, and take field voles, but in same apply to a whole range of other predators like uh, kestrel and berlin, uh, goshawks, short-eared owl, the whole range of species that will work that way. Uh, so, and then this is thinking about higher up in, in the highlands and uh, at altitude, we have, these, are, these are small trees, we call them wee trees in Scotland. So this is dwarf birch, uh, classic high altitude shrub species uh, that provides almost as the tree, as it starts to get too high, too cold for trees, trees get smaller and this kind of more stunted species provides a bit of, a bit of mini forest above the tree line that uh, provides that other species will specialize in. So animals like ring ouzel, um, which is a quite a rare and uncommon bird, um, will thrive up here, it's got a few perches here. Um, but also looking at, well, this is sorry, this is a montane willow, so it's like a dwarf willow. Some of these are really rare. And again, back in that tree nursery I showed at the start, it's one of their specialisms is, is growing these super rare species uh, with all kinds of technical approaches to, to keeping them going in the nursery so we can plant them out and re-establish them. And some of the wildlife that come that come, comes with that at altitude and benefits from that sort of habitat. This is a snow bunting, but species like golden plover and twite and curlew and dotterel, wood sandpiper, a whole range of, uh, of bird life in particular that uh, does better where there's more habitat in the mountains. Ptarmigan uh, is another classic one that can feed and shelter uh, in these, in these montane uh, woodlands. And then thinking, going to the other end, right down in the in the bottom of the valleys on the on the um, side rivers and lochs. Uh, this is an aspen tree, and it's kind of autumnal colours. Um, and aspen will uh, is is one that when it gets to the banks, it starts to drop those leaves. Uh, there's, a, there's a really good phrase about rewilding, which is by leaves we live. And this, where trees can establish, and they're dropping leaves into soil or into water. There again, they're they're offering those nutrients to that system. That uh, then starts starts to enrich that water system. So here, this is water vole, uh, quite a rare species that we do have in Glen Affric, uh, and some of the places we operate. But uh, they kind of need this this cycling a bit of enrichment. This is it just speaks to the need for for mammals and birds and insects to have access to, to fruit uh, at times of year. Um, but as Nutrients go into the system, then it's, it's the invertebrates that really start to uh, start to pay back up the food chain. So this is a mayfly larva and a caddisfly. So these wee things you'll find in stream bottoms that uh, encase themselves, they get a little glue and they encase themselves in this sort of rock armour. 
and then they become a that'll mature into a fly and these are uh, great food species food prey species for uh, for aquatic animals like the dipper uh, where you see a dipper you've probably got clean water in the highlands and uh, this animal can swim underwater be bit like a tiny penguin and uh, we'll, we'll chase after insects there and uh, uh, start to again uh, bring that food chain up the bring that food up the food chain frogs um, are a, are a uh, really important intermediate species, so they're obviously pre predating on insects, um, but they themselves are a key uh, a key prey species for uh, some of our other animals. Eels as well, uh, and fish. Uh, so this is a sea trout, brown trout. I forget which actually. You can check on that. Um, and these you know, fish are really important, especially the ones that migrate from the sea because they're bringing nutrients from the sea. You know, some amazing studies about how marine night nitrogen is finding its way into our landscape and is a key part then of feeding the soils in our landscapes. So that connection that you don't naturally make between sea and land is really important. Uh, and then when we have these species, then they're supporting the kind of the apex predators. So this is osprey uh, or the fish eagle in many countries. And uh, the otter is uh, in Scotland, a, a key way of taking frogs and eels and fish and the nutrients they have, and it'll carry that. It'll carry them onto the land. Uh, it'll it'll feed itself, feed its feed its litter, but also it'll leave carcasses there to decompose. That's where this kind of uh, cycling of nutrients keeps going, keeps building. I just want to mention today is a big day for us, so I'm going to mention these guys. Um, Trees for Life has launched a crowdfunder just today. We are looking to judicially review the Scottish government uh, to reduce the extent to which beavers are killed in the Scottish countryside. And you can find out more about that on our website. Uh, I'll not get into the whole beaver issue because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a big issue in itself. But um, if, if you're interested in beavers and interested in this kind of story, they're a hugely important keystone species and can bring so much back to our landscapes. Uh, so uh, do check that out on our websites right on our homepage. And finally, this is just what it's all about. This is the land. This is Glen Affric looking west and Trees for Life's mission, if you like, and its vision is to see more of this kind of resurging nature uh, coming across the landscape and, and heading from the kind of core forest that, that is all the ancient forest is just behind the camera here. And uh, what we're all about is, is what's out there in, the, in this open landscape and bringing this forest back. And um, what you're looking at there is, is really the, the, kind of the advanced wave of, of forest that uh, we're looking to push west. So um, I've no idea how long that took, Steph, but hopefully it wasn't too long or too short. I think it's fascinating because I suppose my assumption with a trees are for life was something very much more around our mindset with everything is climate change and, and you know, the, the priority of trees in, in reducing climate with their sequestration of carbon, but actually trees are for life is literally the ecosystem and the habitat that that you know, that you guys are actually allowing. And it's, it's, it's quite startling. I, I suppose I hadn't realized the extent of wildlife that's made its way back into, into that region. It's incredible. Where you get it right, it can really, it can really restore itself. And these, are, uh, what, you, what I was just showing there, that's uh, an increasingly carbon rich landscape. So you know, it's, it's really relevant to the climate emergency. And I suppose uh, just a couple of questions. Why was there this huge decline or this deforestation in Scotland? What was that down to? Uh, a mix of things over well, particularly the last few centuries. Um, so there was, Paddleboard began around about, particularly in the 18th century, the 1700s, a lot of forests were felled for, for timber supplies, for mm -hmm. but also for charcoal. So they used charcoal, they used timber derived charcoal to run the iron furnaces in the 1700s and a bit before that. Um, but also since then, uh, the arrival of sheep uh, in the landscape in the highlands that led to, so that's kind of related to, uh, we'll get into the, the clearances and stuff like that, but you know, those hundreds of thousands of sheep brought up to the highlands that became millions. And uh, sheep of course will, uh, they'll eat young trees. Uh, and so every spring when, those, when a baby tree just sticks its head up above the vegetation, Increasingly, they were getting bitten. So um, basically, all our all our mummy and daddy trees couldn't uh, couldn't have babies, mm. and so slowly we, we lost forest as well as them having the kind of history of clear fell by man over millennia for, before that. But really, the last three and four centuries really saw, saw that kind of increase a lot. 
Interesting. Fantastic. Well, just as we hand over to Freddie to talk about discarded Christmas trees, can I just get your personal view on that? I, you mentioned something to me on the phone about actually the kind of Christmas trees that we have in our houses are grown for that specific purpose. So they're maybe not quite as damning as perhaps we think, or is that an incorrect? Is that a misconception? How evil is the Christmas tree? Um, well, there's a whole range of species used for Christmas trees. And um, I think where we've got commercial, so this is kind of related to commercial forestry. Christmas tree growing is a form of commercial forestry. We need commercial forestry because we need timber supplies and the, and the less distance our timber has to cover for us to use it, the better for its carbon footprint. Um, however, where you've got one species being grown, which is usually the case with commercial forestry, then there's very little value for nature in that. Mm. There's a little, but you're basically consigning uh, land that's got much more potential for nature uh, to one that's got less potential, where you've got these kind of conifer trees. I mean, pine is one of them, but whether it's just one species, they grow densely together, very little light gets to the gets to the floor so that um, all the... Um, all the flowers and the shrubs that Frederick wants to brew beer with uh, can't grow. Uh, the soil starts to get more simplified as well, just because the the, the nature of, of those species. Uh, so I would say it is moderately evil. <laughs> I would say that slightly to moderately evil. I, I'm taking away the guilt by hoping that someone from Freddie's team is going to come to my house and pick mine up <laughs> and make it into delicious beer. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that all helps. Well, just as the last uh, last point, we, we did ask that question earlier about the oldest tree in the UK. Do you do you know the answer at the top of your head? Uh, I'm going to guess it was the oldest category you had there. And I'm going to guess it's the Fortingall U. Is that what we had, Tim? I think so. Which is 5,000 years old? Ooh, it's a Fort it's right. that, that, that might be even older than the Fortingall U, but um, yeah, there are some oh, amazing old trees around. 3,000? I would say so, yeah. It's just insane, insane amount, isn't it, really? Yeah. Awesome. Well, listen, thank you so much, Alan. And if anyone has any question about Trees for Life or are interested in the cause, please do reach out directly via their website, their crowdfunding. I think the picture of those beavers uh, was beyond cute, so I'm definitely going to go and find out <laughs> what that's all about. And thank you so much for sharing all those images. I think there's nothing nicer sometimes than cute animals on a screen. Yeah. <laughs> Brings a smile to us all. All right, Freddie, over to you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, so just as a brief introduction, my name is Freddie Campman. I'm the founder and chief botanical officer at Lowlander Beer. And at Lowlander, we have and I have been brewing with all kinds of weird and wonderful ingredients, uh, aka botanicals, so herbs, spices and fruits for coming up to five years. The 6th of January next year, we will celebrate our fifth birthday. Uh, previous to launching Lowlander, I worked in beer, so I worked in breweries in Belgium and the Netherlands, but then moved to the UK, worked for a brewery there as well, and ended up in gin. So it's no surprise that I now brew with botanicals, because it's basically bridging uh, the stuff I know, but also the stuff I'm most passionate about. And I saw a real kind of gap or opportunity, whatever you want to call it, to actually bring something different to the brewing industry and, and the beer world, which was basically centered around the core idea that if we can broaden the horizons of people uh, in terms of what they normally expect of beer, then actually you could have a very interesting conversation. Um, for us, sustainability has kind of been something which we started with and continue to do uh, as much in as we can. Uh, given that we're a small company, we can't do everything and we can't do everything in one go. But it's basically centered around kind of two ways we do this. One is taking less from the planet. And the second thing is, the second pillar is giving back to the planet. So to give you two examples in terms of take less and give back, take less. One of the examples is what we do is that we use the spec capacity at existing breweries if you look at the average uh, environmental footprint of a smaller craft brewery versus a slightly bigger regional or, or commercial brewery, then the water usage is five times less. Uh, CO2 is 32 times less. Um, so everybody, of course, is highly motivated to always buy something local, which I think is great. But you always need to factor in also where things are produced and how they're produced. And often that is maybe not as necessarily as sustainable. 
Um, so that is one example of take less. The other one example is take less is that we use um, discarded lemon and orange peels, for example, from bars and restaurants, which we use in one of our beers. So when the Tim as a bartender maybe squeezes an orange juice, um, the peels gets normally get chucked and we now reuse those in, in one of the beers as a prime ingredient to deliver flavor. Two examples of giving back are actually limited to one example because then the second example will tie to the, the reason why we're all here and that's Christmas trees and, and, and Christmas time. An uh, example of giving back is a, we launched a, a lager, a new beer for us brewed with, uh, with lemongrass. Absolutely delicious, but the nicest thing about it is that we completely tailored that beer to a good cause. So with each beer you buy, we will plant a seagrass plant in the Dutch Waddenzee, which is the sea north at the northern part of the Netherlands. And one of those tiny little plants is 35 times more effective than planting one tree in the tropical rainforest. Um, so really interesting kind of ingenious way of improving, if you like, or reducing your carbon footprint, um, which I never knew about until about a year ago. Um, but that brings me kind of nicely onto the thing I didn't know about two years ago, which is, and there is the question by magic, uh, which is the Christmas tree. So the question here for all of us is how many Christmas trees do you think get thrown away or chucked as we like to call it every year? And this is specifically to the UK. I'll vote myself and wait for the answers to come in and I'll carry on with my story. So. The whole idea for um, one of the new beers we launched uh, two years ago was a, was a winter IPA, but our whole idea came from basically running uh, my normal running route in Amsterdam, uh, which took me over the canals into Wester Park, for those who know it. And I think it was the beginning of January, so probably like, I don't know, the 9th or the 10th or the 8th. Uh, and I saw all of these Christmas trees basically lined up in front of people's doors and houses. Some still had all the decorations on, so some were full of with um, fake snow. Uh, others were literally chucked out of the window, as people do. Um, and I just thought, like, it just can't be possible. Um, it's, it's, it's something, I don't know what happened, but I just thought, like, I should investigate whether there's something we can do with the waste. Because to me, oh, here we go with the answer. 64% uh, 6 million. Well done. Perfect. That is the right answer. Just for reference, in the Netherlands, it's 2.5 million. In the UK, it's 6 million trees. And that is just to clarify single use Christmas trees. So 6 million trees get planted every year, three to five years later, depending on how much pesticides and other kind of nasty stuff we use. They get pulled out of the ground, they get sold. We have them in our house. We there's one behind you, Stephanie, I'm looking at you, but this, we have them in our house, we decorate them, we have gifts around them and under them, we have the most magical family moments, all kinds of other stuff might happen. Um, and then as per magic, 6th of Jan comes or potentially even the 1st of Jan, people are fed up, they open the window and they chuck it out like waste. Um, and if you think about it, it's, it's just such a big, uh, big waste stream, which we never really think about. Um, if you compare it, of course, to a, an artificial tree, it's a better option. So fake trees coming out of China, which made of plastic are incredibly even worse, but there are alternatives, which I'll tell you something about in a minute. But back to the idea of, of, of this, this running route to seeing all this waste. Uh, I knew for my gin days that you could actually create something very tasteful, especially in the Nordic countries they make loads of aquavits and gins out of uh, all kinds of tree species, whether that's a, a spruce or a pine. They often use the needles and or other parts of the tree bark, bark and tree bark, etc., which is actually really interesting flavor ingredient. Um, so I knew you could make something out of it in gin. I wasn't sure whether you could do a similar thing in beer. So I spent the next six months trialing and erroring on different ways of extracting the flavor and brewing, uh, brewing the beer. In the end, I succeeded. And that led to us sending out a press release. I think it was in the lead up to Christmas. Uh, and basically that Christmas, that press release got picked up. And before we knew it, our whole website are down because we basically made a simple promise that if someone would register their tree on our website, we would come and pick it up on our back feet, which is like our electrical bikes we use in the Netherlands. 
and we would collect those trees and then we would pick them and then we would brew the beer with them. So before we knew it, we had a website which was down. We had, uh, I think at 150, we had to close it because it went on to a thousand registered trees. But of course we couldn't process that many trees, even 150 trees. We thought we could process with a team of volunteers around 30 people within a day. It took us in the end five days um, to pick all of them. More or less for people who are interested on average, it takes one person a full day to pick all the needles because it's not like rosemary where you can just rip them off or uh, there are no tools for it. So it's actually needle by needle uh, through, uh, through kind of labor of love and, and, and craft. Um, and um, we picked all those trees had the needles, we basically made an extract out of it. It's a technical um, process, so I'll skip that for a little bit, and then brewed the next winter, um, uh, our winter IPA, our lowland winter IPA, which basically was brewed with discarded uh, spruce needles. Really kind of interesting uh, twist on an IPA, very fresh, beautiful flavors of citrus, uh, green kind of evergreen winter tones. And for me, it, it's it like if you walk into a forest after it's, after it's rained, that smell basically is encapsulated in that bottle. So absolutely delicious. Um, and what started from a kind of tiny little idea uh, basically became something much bigger. Um, the only problem we had was that if we would do the same thing again this year, we would end up with multiple or thousands of trees. So we thought we have to kind of pivot and think differently. So what we're doing now is three things. First of all, for every bottle we sell, we will plant additional seeds in our own lowlander Christmas tree forest. I'll tell you about that a little bit. Secondly, we're proactively promoting and selling through a partner um, adopted Christmas trees. So trees, Christmas trees, you can actually adopt. And if you think about the plastic Christmas tree, if you think about the single use Christmas trees we just spoke about, the best thing you could do is actually have a tree which still all the roots on, ideally still in its original pot, which you can buy at not that many uh, growers, but more and more growers, and afterwards hand it back to the grower or plant it in your own garden and basically look after it for a year and then the next year use that tree again. And if you do that well, you could use that same tree because of course, because of heat, because of underwatering, because of light, because of all kinds of things, not all trees survive, but basically more or less you span, you create a lifetime, not lifetime, you create a lifetime of eight years for that specific adopter tree, uh, which is a really different and, and more sustainable solution to single use Christmas trees. Um, so that is something we're actively promoting at the moment. And then something new, which we're launching as part of our kind of initiative to make people aware that you can create something tasteful out of waste is that from the beginning of January, we will launch a campaign, which is called how to eat and drink your Christmas tree. So people can order a kit online through our web shop with a guide and a booklet, including four beers, alcoholic or four non-alcoholic beers, where we basically give people the recipes and all the inspiration to pick their own needles as they are in their house, cook a four course dinner with it. So that will range from spruce needle butter to a salmon cured in um, juniper berries and, 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 and spruce, of course, forest ribs, um, you name them, four, four beautiful ingredients matched with four beers. Again, to make people aware that actually the, 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 the waste of a tree uh, could actually be used into something, uh, something quite delicious. So that is kind of what we're doing with trees, beer and botanicals. Um, if there are any questions, more than happy to uh, answer them. I mean, it's it's so cool, Freddie. It's so <laughs> cool. Um, I suppose, well, I mean, living in Amsterdam and, and having the same experience as you with literally seeing people chuck trees out of their window, mm. like from their window, it's the most obscene thing. Do you think that there's definitely an issue, like from a council perspective as well, that potentially you're highlighting? I mean, you gave people a solution, yeah. more people than you could handle, um, yeah. you know, wrote into you guys, but surely it made them aware that, you know, what, what the heck can we do with the damn trees? And actually, 
is it even right to have it now? I, I appreciate culture. I yeah. believe in tradition, but after a while, you know, the tradition is yeah, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I'm all for the tradition, actually. I love to have, I have a Christmas tree at home. Thank God it's an adopted Christmas tree, so we'll go back to the grower. But um, I, I think you're right. I mean, I think we, all of us together, have created the, the solution to the problem, i.e. it's waste. If you chuck it on the, on the street, it will get picked up, right? And um, the, the beauty is that we've been approached by so many local councils, so many big companies over the last two years of saying like, oh, Ikea, for example. Oh, we got these... I can't remember the number, 500 Christmas trees, which are all around their stores. Would you mind using them and creating something? And of course we said, oh, we would love to, but you would have to help too. Could you supply the volunteers or something? And then it goes quiet. So there's such a big, big problem. We're definitely not going to solve it. You know what I mean? We, we Maybe we can do play our small part in just making people aware. And I think that's already started to happen, but I think it's, it's, you need the structural solutions of an infrastructure and, and supplier base who can actually give something which is more sustainable. And maybe that's adopt a Christmas tree, maybe that's a different route, right? Which we don't know about yet. And then also at the back end, you need to make sure that councils do their thing to educate people about what they should do with their trees. And I mean, thank God they're not burning them anymore, like all of them anymore, because that of course is- The release of carbon. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, there's still a long way to go, I think. So I suppose top tips and maybe help me out here. If you are going to get a tree at all, and if you are going to get a tree that is cut down, AKA this one, and you don't have Freddie that's going to come and pick it up for you, which apparently is not happening this year. So I'm going to have to eat it, but I will eat it. I will eat it. I will drink it. I'm going to get that kit. Um, I suppose one thing is offset it at least. So plant a tree elsewhere. I suppose the other one is the one my parents have always done. And I used to think it's because my dad was being stingy, but he has a potted Christmas tree that he brings in year on year. I call it, my sister called it the Christmas shrub. And then sometimes it looks good and sometimes it's a bit brown, (laughs) but you know, 15 years in, it's the same damn tree. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I think, I think the best thing is drink drink a lowland IPA, right? Because then we will plant trees for you. But now, it's like the things you mentioned, it, it's I think there are quite a few alternatives, right? Um, yeah. And it's it is about personal preference. I mean, personally, if you keep your uh, plastic Christmas tree, whether it's from China or not, if you keep that long enough, i.e., fifty years, then of course that's going to be a more sustainable solution than single-use Christmas trees. Mm. But personally, I would never put a fake Christmas tree in my house, right? So it depends on your personal personal circumstances. And I think if, if you buy a single-use Christmas tree, we, we do this now with our partner, um, Beta Bompi, which is Dutch Life for Better Tree. You can just have an option just when you go fly and book a flight, you know what I mean? Like a carbon offset. And you can, in this case, you can buy one tree. And if I think it's for five euros extra, you can plant two additional trees in our Christmas tree forest. Okay. Create these adopted Christmas trees. So then at least you've already offset not just the growing of one, but actually of two. So yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. And I think we can definitely take a leaf um and so even further north than in the Netherlands in the UK to the Scandi countries because they their minimalist designs, they have these fancy little wooden twigs which you just bring out year on year and you hang your decoration on. Yeah. And actually, you know, minimum impact, natural materials, and they just look really, really lovely. Yeah. Um, Okay, super insightful, Freddie. Thank you so much. I think everyone really, really enjoyed learning a bit more about trees and eating them and drinking them. Um, quick question, are you available in the UK? Yep, we you are. are indeed. Fantastic. Normal channels online, Amazon, and hopefully, fingers crossed, going into a retailer soon. Exciting. So uh, the UK alternative to Amazon happens to be on live, My Green Pods Marketplace. So I'd recommend you have a chat with Katie at the end of this. Thanks. Brill. Okay. So our last session of today's festive edition is Meneer Tim Lefebvre, who is coming in from Amsterdam. Hello. Hello. Hi. And what are you going to talk to us about today? Um, we'll be talking uh, a little bit about um, sustainable drinking, ways to implement uh, sustainability into your own little kitchen and home bars, especially right now with bars being closed and how to get through the holidays 
because we all know we kind of need a drink during the holidays and, and Christmas dinners um, with family. Um, so she find a way how we can do that in a more sustainable way. So that, that's a nice intro to our question, which is uh, how much alcohol is consumed by Brits over the festive season? Now, we're assuming the festive season is six days. This is an average per day consumption question. So is it 10 units, 18 units, or 26 units? We'll let you answer, and uh, either Tim or I will give you the response at the end. So over to you. I think you're sharing your screen, right? Yes, I am, yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's have a quick north or south. <laughs> Start playing. Uh, desktop, yeah. There we go. Can okay. everyone see this? Yeah, we're in. Beautiful. Awesome. Um, so hi to everyone uh, that's looking. Thank you for being here. Um, as you can see, I'll be talking a bit about low waste and uh, wintry drinks um, today. We'll go to a quick introduction just real fast. So my name is Tim. Um, I am a bar manager here in Amsterdam. Uh, I also founded um, a platform for sustainable drinking uh, called Hiveball Project. Um, and if I'm not doing drinks, you'll tend to find me with my nose between a book. That's enough for that. Um, and then um, we're going into low waste and winter drinks. Now, um, I know that does, that might not ring a bell for everyone. So I've quickly summed it up what that kind of means. Um, so when we talk about low waste in drink making or in, in cocktail drinks um, making, um, we'll tend to look at um, ingredients that are seasonal, uh, local, uh, with that, that already creates the uh, creates kind of low impact products. Um, we try to use our ingredients as circular as possible, so we try to get every tiny bit out of them as much as we can, and then we try to look at taking products that have either a high shelf life, or we try to take products and create new products that have high shelf life so that last a long time. Um, and then we talk about wintry flavors. We're thinking more nostalgic, cold weather flavors, a bit more comforting things, um, things we can very often actually find more in aged spirits um, or warming flavors like baking spices, nuts, wood, all these kinds of things. Um, then, so that, that's kind of what we'll talk about today. Um, I found a beautiful little quote, which I feel is very fitting to the current situation. Um, no amount of physical contact could match the healing powers of a well-made cocktail. Very important in times where we're not able to hug, but we can still have a drink together. And then we'll get on with the presentation. So there's many, many ways of um, making drinks more sustainable. Um, to keep it a bit more short and overviewable, I've chosen to talk about three preservation methods today that you can use in your own um, kitchen, or at your bar um, easily um, and, and can have a really nice effect on uh, the way we drink. Um, the three methods I'll be talking about all have one thing in common um, and the thing they have in common is all of them use a similar ingredient which is vinegar. Um, now I know that for some people that can sound kind of intense um, but you'll see that in the way we use it it actually is really nice and adds a lot of more depth uh, and layers to your drinks. So first off, what is vinegar? Uh, no, it sounds a bit weird. Everyone knows what vinegar is. Everyone's used it um, either in the kitchen or on chips or um, maybe even for cleaning. Um, I'll quickly talk about just what it is and then you have that um, as a bit of background information. Um, so vinegar is basically a um, second fermentation of alcohol. So as Frederick especially will know is alcohol, and as you will probably know as well, alcohol comes from a fermentation process. So that means that um, there is sugar and yeast and water, and the yeast will eat the sugars and turn those into alcohol in a very simple, simply put way. Um, and then to get vinegar, we take that alcohol that's created and we actually add a bacteria um, which needs oxygen to be able to do its job. So we add a bacteria, we need air um, to the, we add that to the alcohol and then the bacteria will actually turn the alcohol into acetic acid, which is a scientific word for vinegar, basically. 
Um, and then in the making of it, they'll often either use a yeast that will die off at a low alcohol percentage. So that way the yeast does not eat all the sugars. So some sugar is left and that creates actually for more balanced acidity in your vinegar. So it's not all sourness. There's still some sugar in there to balance it out, to make it more palatable. Um, and then vinegar can be made from as a lot of things, basically anything containing sugar. So fruit, vegetables, grain, rice, you've probably seen loads and loads of different types of vinegars in the shops. Uh, it can be made from alcoholic products like low ABV products, such as wine, like white wine vinegar, fortified wine, um, hard cider as well. Um, or it can even be made from spirits or neutral grain alcohol, um, distilled vinegar. So that's a little, little short background on vinegar as you'll see it pop uh, back and forth now. Um, the first thing we will, oh, sorry, my screen just kind of blocked here. Oh, there we go. Um, so preservation techniques using vinegar, um, three techniques to utilize this winter. Um, so in this order, we'll talk about pickling, we'll talk about shrub making, and we'll talk about a little thing called oxymel. Um, and with all the techniques you'll see, I, I have, I will talk a little bit about the actual technique. Um, you'll see a recipe that I came up with um, actually during the last lockdown, because there's plenty of time and pickling and preservation usually takes some time. So it's perfect time um, to do it. And then there will be a drink following up with the recipes um, using Avalon. Um, and all drinks actually, if you look back at them, will create a three course drinking menu that you can use during your Christmas dinners um, in order of how you eat. So the first one is pickles. Um, pickling has been around for centuries and centuries. So it's actually been around for at least 4,000 years. Um, it's one of the oldest preservation techniques around. Uh, it actually comes from the Dutch word um, pekel or pekelen. Um, and then you tend to use uh, vegetables or fruit, it's also possible. Um, pickles, you'll usually see vegetables though. Um, and then you'll need vinegar, you'll need a little bit of sugar, not super necessary, not obliged to use sugar. It just tends to help soften things a wee bit. Um, and then herbs and spices and salt. Um, so I've added a little recipe here. So it's a pickled radishes um, and apple leftovers. Um, so like I said, last lockdown, radishes were flourishing. So they're very seasonal and local. So you clean them, cut them, slice them up. Um, and then you take leftover apple core. So a lot of times when you cook with apples um, or if you um, make a fruit salad even, you'll get the apple core out and you'll peel them because it's a bit more pleasant to eat and easier to process in food. Um, so rather than just discarding those apple cores and peels, um, you can keep them and you can use them in this recipe um, or any uh, pickling recipe. Um, then we'll use some apple cider vinegar, um, some water. Uh, so you can see I've used an equal part uh, vinegar water. All the recipes you can change around to your own taste. It's a matter of experimenting. Um, some sea salt, some mustard seeds and a bit of dill, um, we'll give it, which will give it like a really fresh green note. Pop it all together in a non-reactive container, seal it, and then keep it stored for a minimum of three to four days, preferably a week. You'll notice that obviously the longer you keep it, the more flavor it will extract and the bigger and bolder the flavors will get. Um, and then just taste it daily. As soon as you feel like it's gotten to the flavor where you like it, you can remove the apple cores. At this point, you can discard them. So you've, you've very much completely drain them from flavor and there's not loads of, there's no more flesh or anything to eat as well. Um, so again, circular usage, you've, you've used the thing you'd normally throw away. Um, keep the radishes and peels in there. Uh, I love them in salads. They just give a really nice, fresh, uh, vibrant flavor to your salad um, or, or you can use it on sandwiches in so many ways. And then keep it sealed in the fridge. Um, and that's, that's how you'll usually do it for home cooking. Um, but then often people wonder what to do with the brine and they'll throw it away, which is a, a, a bit of a shame because you can use it in drinks as well, just in low quantities often. Um, so 
This is the drink um, that I've created for, for the pickles. So it's an aperitif drink. Like I said, what you can have before dinner. Um, basically, it's very easy to make. So you, you take a champagne flute um, or whatever glass you like, um, preferably something more elegant. Um, 45 ml of Avalon, 15 ml of the brine we just made, and then 45 ml or more or less, just top off to your own flavor of a, of a sparkling fruit wine. If you can find some, usually in, in your local shops, and, and actually specifically in more um, ecologic friendly shops, you'll find sparkling fruit wines from all over. So in this case, I've used a gooseberry champagne. Um, you build them up and you'll just have like a really nice, fresh and vibrant drink to have before dinner. Then we go on to the next method, which is the shrubs. So shrubs is, is a bit of a, a trickier one because there's, there's quite some discussion about what exactly is a shrub. Uh, there's several ways to make it. Um, I've kept it real simple for this. Um, so the, the word shrub comes from the Arabic sharab, which means to drink. Um, and that's why very often you'll see shrubs are also called drinking vinegars because they're literally very easy to just, they're very soft on, on your palate and they're very easy to drink. Um, and then you can lengthen them with some sparkling water if you want to make them a bit more fresh. Uh, you can use them in drinks as well, as we'll see in a second. Uh, again, you'll use fruit or vegetables. More often you'll use fruit, but you can definitely also use vegetables. Um, and then you add vinegar. And this is kind of where it gets tricky. If you add raw vinegar, you'll have what's known as an actual shrub because uh, raw vinegar still has the bacteria and sometimes even has the mother. Um, still in there, so it'll, it'll create its own fermentation process. Um, if you can find any raw vinegar, you can definitely use normal vinegar. Um, you add some sugar, uh, again, herbs and spices that match with the fruit or vegetables you've used. Play around with it. The world's your oyster. You can, you can do it as crazy as you want. Um, and then the recipe we have is a bit of an apple pie shrub. So actually the the bits of apple that we have from the previous drink where we kept the apple cores and the, the peels, we take the flesh of that apple now in this um, drink. Um, and then we add some uh, vinegar, apple cider vinegar in this case, some sugar, and then some nice baking spices, cardamom, nutmeg, cinnamon, all these warm baking spices, mold wine spices, basically you can use for this. Um, what, you, what is very important to notice is in the pickling, uh, as I said, uh, you don't have to use sugar. You can if you want to, and if you do, just a little bit, um, whereas this has a lot more sugar. So this is more towards an equal part vinegar sugar, uh, and that just creates a very balanced, sweet and sour, very approachable drink, uh, which then um, actually explains why it's often referred to as drinking vinegar. The amount of sugar in this will make it a lot more palatable. Again, combine it all in a non-reactive container. Uh, I tend to use uh, glass mason jars. Make sure they're very thoroughly clean. Um, you don't need any extra bacteria in there. Uh, make sure it's really clean. Um, add everything. Keep it stored for, again, minimum three to four days, preferably a week in, in a cool place. Um, taste it daily. And when you feel like it's ready, just strain off the solids shake it up, make sure it's really mixed up, put it in a bottle and put it in your fridge and you can store it for months. Um, shorts are also a very, um, very good way to um, make drinks for people that aren't drinking alcohol. Obviously there's, there's plenty of people that don't want to drink booze, um, but you also don't want to just add some syrup and juice and water. So if you, if you can create a really nice, interesting shrub and then lengthen that with soda water, um, you can actually give people that don't want to drink an interesting drink still. Uh, the recipe we've made though is a bit of a boozy one. <laughs> so this is a Christmas stocking punch. Um, big quantity. So I made this in actually a punch size, so a, a bit of a bigger batch um, because then you can just store it in your fridge and you can, it's ready to drink. You can pour yourself a glass whenever you feel like it. Um, so this one requires a bottle of Avalon, um, about a third of a bottle of sherry, so about 250 milliliters, um, around a bottle of apple pie shrub, 
um, about 300 milliliters of cold water. Uh, the cold water will basically only it'll dilute your drink. So it'll add the dilution you would normally get from shaking it or stirring it. Um, so that makes it ready to drink. That way you can just open the bottle, pour it in a glass, over ice, not over ice, however you want it, and it's straight away diluted and it's at a good alcohol level. Um, if you have some bitters, you can add some bitters to it as well. I would personally, with this drink, go for a bit more baking spice bitters. Uh, there's, there's plenty out there. Um, so again, mix it together, store it in your fridge. Um, if the Christmas family dinner gets too much, sneak off to the fridge, pour a bit in a glass, uh, and definitely leave some in your Christmas stocking for Santa, so he can leave extra jolly as well. Amazing. So that's the three, no, sorry, that's the two drinks. Go on to the last one. And this is actually my personal favorite preservation method. Uh, I know Tim um, also likes it um, and it's an oxymel. So oxymel comes from the Greek oxymeli, which means acid and honey, very straightforward. Um, and it was uh, very often used by and written about by Hippocrates back in the, in the old days. Um, so you use a local organic honey and a vinegar and then you mix those two together and then you add in a bunch of herbs whichever ones you want basically but it's very clever to take herbs that well often it'll be herbs that aren't really nice on their own so this is a nice way to soften the flavor um and a lot of herbs and botanicals have a really good health benefit so it's very clever to look those up and add those um, and it's just going to make a, a drink that's just very good for you throughout the winter, whether you drink it with something or on its own or in, a, in an alcoholic beverage or warm it up because um, it's, it's literally known to be very soft on your throat and help fight cold uh, and all kinds of things. Um, so the one I have made is a wildflower and um, chili oxymel. So 300 ml, so it's an equal parts of local organic honey, um, apple cider vinegar again, some wild nettle and dandelions. Be careful with taking wild nettle. Obviously it'll sting you if you don't wear gloves. Uh, and just a teaspoon of chili flakes. Again, combine, store it, leave it for a week minimum, taste it every day, strain off the solids, shake it up. Um, and store a ball in your fridge for, it says months, but you can store it for forever, really. Um, cool, which brings us to the last beverage, which is an Avalon toddy. Um, also one of my favorite drinks, especially this season. So it's a nice warm beverage. It's Avalon, it's the Oxymel and just some hot water, build in a mug and give it a quick stir. And it's just packed, packed, packed with um, benefits for your health. It, it'll literally get you through the winter um, completely. So that was the three drinks using the three methods. Um, so we had, we had the pickling, the shrub, the shrub. and the oxymel. Yeah. And, and exactly. actually, Tim, you're, you're such an expert, right? Like you, you talk about it with such geeky easiness. I still, and I've been in the industry a while, I still look at half of it and I go, oh my God, that looks so hard to do. But these techniques have been around since the wake of man, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so these things have literally been around for, since like pickling's 4,000 years old. Um, Oxymel, the Greeks used it. Um, shrubs, 15th century sailing would not have been the same if it didn't have these kinds of preservation techniques, like it literally stored ingredients for them. Which is bonkers. Um, I think we think we've all yeah. evolved so much and yet we can't do some of the basic things our ancestor did, right? Which is like preserving food. Um, so this is super, super insightful. What will you be drinking this Christmas? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm planning on having um, a couple toddies tonight um just going for a walk and taking them with me in a thermos i think that's actually the nicest thing to have them outside adult apple um, juice. 
Yes, exactly. Adult apple juice. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we have to do it what we can now that bars are closed. So we create our own little bar environment. Um, so yeah, I, I tend to take toddies with me on walks, uh, just in a thermos. Um, and I almost always have a bottle of punch in the fridge as well. Um, just for when I feel like having a drink, but I don't feel like going through an effort or whatever, or if I'm out of ice or something like that, it's just easy to pour. Brilliant. Any, yeah. any parting words, any last top tips for us? Or have you, have you given us your highlights? Uh, I mean, there's, there's just, there's, if there's, there's some last note to this, it's, it's very much, um, what I just said is, is very much based on, um, my palate and, and how I, from, from my profession, know people like drinks. Um, uh, but I think it's very important to know that drinks taste different for everyone. Um, so just don't be afraid to like mix it up, pour in a little more of this or a little less of that. Um, and, and just remember that if you experiment with making ingredients and making drinks, you'll, you'll fail, um, sometimes. Um, and that should just never stop you from keep on trying. Like it's by failure that we learn. So just like have a look at it all and, and just pick whatever you can find. Obviously make sure it's nothing toxic um, and, and just, just build drinks and have fun with it. I think that's the most important thing is just have fun with it. Brilliant. I totally agree. And I feel like you've actually given me some inspiration for some fun presents you know I could just gift a bottle of Avalon but I could gift a bottle of Avalon with a little flask and and some honey and some bits and bobs to make your own toddy at home so ultimately it's about exactly. the experiences which I think is lovely um right yeah. just to, to wrap up then um on that polling question the answer is actually 26 units a day again over an average of six days and that's an increase of times 10 of what your average bit would have on a night out. So actually drinking sustainably during Christmas can have a huge ecological uh, impact. So something something to consider. Um, all right, guys, well, that's kind of a wrap for our sixth edition of Positively Charged. Tim's come back online. We've got a few minutes. If any of our audience have any burning questions we can take them now unless any of our panelists have a question that they want to ask one another um, not really you all just want to have timmy's drinks don't you that's what you're thinking. i want to have a beer really yeah <laughs> you want to be there oh we got eve ready Bloody headphones. <laughs> They're better now. Yeah. I think we should try whether we can make a drink, Tim, with uh, some spruce needles. Yes. Yes, we definitely should. I think that's actually a really fun idea. I was thinking that earlier as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's funny. Actually, my... I think that's the recipe. If you remove the, the wild metals or have the wild metals in combination with... Brilliant. Yeah. yeah, yeah my definitely. dad that's, got that's, a that's Christmas it. tree and all he's done is complain about the needles since he got it. <laughs> So you, you guys have definitely inspired me to do something with those needles. Whether I drink them or eat them, um, they'll definitely be making their way into some ingredients this Christmas. So I have um, one fantastic question, which is open to all of us. And the question is, if there was one holiday tradition we could magically replace with something more sustainable, besides trees, beers and cocktails, what would it be? one thing we could do differently that we haven't mentioned that would have a tremendously positive impact um i'm gonna be cheeky i i think it just kind of goes in with what katie said as well when she said just give people your time because it's worth so much i think just being being kind and reaching out to someone you may have not reached out to for a while or, or someone you don't often talk to, just reach out and, and give them a shout, especially during times like this. I think that's definitely something that will give a nice impact. Nice, awesome. Anyone else very philosophical? I think what, what would be nice, I mean, we were just, last week we ordered our uh, Christmas turkey. Mm. And um, the smallest size we would get, could get, sorry, is 11 person. 
and with the corona restrictions like there's no way we're going to invite 11 persons to eat christmas turkey and i know you can make a beautiful delicious curry out of it a sandwich etc etc but <laughs> trust me, after four or five days of eating turkey so it's that's Jan january done with it. january food sorted out right no I'm, I'm, my idea would be like to see whether you could just offer it to whether that's a neighbor or someone down the road or anyone home, really. yeah, homeless people you know you could pick up exactly a store. particularly in the hospitality industry we've seen a, a huge spike in the number of people who have become homeless mm. hospitality shut down so you know, picking up a storm for some people who are less fortunate mm-hmm. or maybe a, a new flavor of lowlander beer <laughs> Don't want to know what I was working on this morning for next year. <laughs> Turkey stout. I love it. <laughs> okay, any other ideas, Katie, Alan? I think yeah. it, for me, it's about it's about knowing who you're buying. It's it's gifts, isn't it? I mean, we're all we all buy gifts, and there's so much. There's a huge carbon footprint associated with a gift. It's about the manufacturer. It's about the air miles. It's like how far it's traveling. What the the overall carbon footprint of one gift that you might buy remotely and that you don't ever see and that you don't kind of you don't you don't think about it at all it just arrives at your doorstep and then you wrap it and you give it away but if you think about the number of the sheer volume of gifts that each person is buying however many I don't know what the average number is but it's it's a lot right and then you look at the population and you just think if everybody were buying a gift that had a positive impact you know, if they were buying, if they were buying a product that was supporting, you know, regrowth and regeneration and conservation and all of these things that we know need to happen, then that would have a massive impact. It would have a huge impact. So every gift that you're giving, it's got a double gift behind it for future generations as well. So for me, that's the biggest thing. It's about just really think about where you're buying stuff from um, and, and the ethics of the company behind the product that you're buying or the gift that you're buying or even the crackers and the wrapping paper that you're buying. Just just really look at who you're giving your money to and what you're supporting. As you guys say, right, a vote a vote for the planet is also a vote with the wallet. And yeah, exactly. Impact change. Awesome. Alan, anything from you? Uh, I think Katie's kind of smashed it. She's taken all the, all the best lines. But I think that idea of giving something back is really important and I think thinking about not just who you're buying from but what you're buying and where from the which resources in the planet that were drawn on to make that are they are they replaceable um and and can you give something back so that you're you're directly contributing to um sustainability I posted somewhere in the chat I posted a, a book I'm reading at the minute called Breeding Sweetgrass and it's about uh, indigenous American peoples and um how they sustain themselves off the land and the relationship they had with the land and how that's completely broken now in consumerist society. And yeah, this, this woman tries to, she's got a relationship with the forest she goes to and she, she takes uh, fruit or plants from the forest to eat. She almost, she asks permission first and sometimes doesn't get it and walks away. And she, she tried to apply the same logic to going to the shopping mall. Uh, and, you know, talked about buying pens, basically all this petrochemically derived stuff. Uh, and how difficult that was and um, just just all these the disconnect we have with the way we live today and the earth so even just the what I already took from that is the effort to make the mental connection between what you're spending money on what you're buying and where in the earth what in the earth provided that I think that is the first step to starting to think like this so that um, more people are, are are joining this kind of call and having this sort of conversation because you know at I don't know anybody on this call, but I imagine we're all pretty much in our in a bubble of consciousness around this. And for a lot of people, it just doesn't cross their minds. So I think promoting that and, and putting that out there in, in, a, in a lot of the ways, you know, and Katie talked about a lot of ways that happened. I think that's, um, that's probably the biggest thing we could do. Oh, that's amazing. That was really from the heart, wasn't it, Alan? Thank you for sharing that. Read the book. All right. Well, that is all we have time for. Um, any parting words, Mr. Etherington Judge? Uh, no, but everyone listening, thank you to all our speakers. Please enjoy a very festive holiday season. Um, stay safe. You know, this has been a very strange year. So you know, this is a time where we need to really enjoy Christmas more than we ever have done before and enjoy our family and our friends and those around us. Um, because it has been the most difficult of years we can possibly have imagined. Um, 
yeah, cook up those Christmas trees, drink some drink some delicious Avalon. Cook um, up the Christmas trees. <laughs> I know what I'll be having instead of a turkey. Christmas <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Be well. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the year. We'll see you in 2021. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye. Adios.